Revelation 3, 7, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Notice now specifically, back in verse 11, where Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I beg you again for the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Speak to our hearts today. Lord, speak deep to our hearts today. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we get the key of this message that you're trying to give us tonight from your word. That, Father, we would hold fast that which we have. That we'd be the church you'd have us to be for your honor and glory. That each believer would be the believer they ought to be for the glory of God. That each family would be the family that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Father, we'll thank you for everything that you do, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you turn back just a page or two to Revelation chapter 1, you find out that the, that the Lord Jesus began speaking to John. In verse 11, he says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. And then he names the seven churches. You'll notice in verse 12, it says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now notice that term candlestick. Because you come down to verse 20, and it says, The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in thy right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. So here we've got the seven golden candlesticks representing the seven churches professing the same faith. People in those churches with like aspirations, with weaknesses, with struggles, with failures and with successes, just like people have today. After all, this is the eternal word of God. And walking among them was Jesus Christ, resurrected, glorified, infinitely holy, Almighty in power, for he is seen in the midst of these churches. He is the one who knew all their secrets, the one whom every church secrets are known and every individual secrets are known over and over again. He says, I know thy works. In the book of Hebrews, he said, all things are naked and open and under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You can't hide anything from him. You can hide things from your neighbor, you can hide things from your spouse, you can hide things from your children, you can hide things from your parents, you can hide things from your pastor, but you can't hide anything from Jesus Christ. He knows everything and he walks in the midst. And as he says to each of these churches, he says, I know thy works. To the one, they had left their first love. They were going through the motions without the proper motivations. And he tells them to remember, to repent and return to your first works. And then to another, he says, you've lost your purity of doctrine. And for those who think that doctrine is not important, ought to read the second letter that he wrote. And they had problems. They had allowed in the Nicolaitans and they had allowed in the doctrine of Balaam, two doctrines that he hated. And he said, repent and set thine house in order. And then to another, he said, you've lost your purity of life. 
You're tolerating the filthy sins of Jezebel. And he said, repent, purge yourself and be clean. And then to another, he says, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. And that church was coasting on its earlier, better days. And there were a few names which had not defiled himself even in the midst of all that. And his message to that church was to repent. And then to the church at Laodicea, the one after the one that we just read, he said, you're lukewarm and you think you're rich when you're naked. And he tells them again to repent. Earlier to the church at Smyrna, he gave a different tone. He said, I know thy works. I know your tribulation. He says, be thou faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. But then the one that we read from tonight is the one with the letter to the church at Philadelphia. It was really the happiest message of all. And he says, you have a little strength and have not denied my name. I mean, truly, in the grand scheme of things, we're just a drop in the bucket. Isn't that right? Just a drop. I mean, we've seen God do great and marvelous things out of this place, call numbers out for missions and all of that, but we are just a drop in the bucket when you figure over six and a half billion people on planet Earth. And we meet together for our gathering each Sunday morning and each Sunday night and so on. And he says to this church, you have a little strength and you've not denied my name. Here they were outnumbered in their whole society. There wasn't a whole lot there to them, but they were faithful. They had not denied his name. And he says, you hold fast that which you have. Hold fast. Now's not the time to back up. Now's not the time to look for some new way to present the message so that it will be more palatable for the lost society that's out there. He's saying, hold fast, lest any man take that crown. You know, at Madison Baptist Church, we have been extremely blessed. I mentioned this the other day. There are times I just meditate on the things that God has done. I mean, you look back over the years and God in this place has done some wonderful things. And the truth is, there are thousands of independent Baptist churches that would love to have seen half the blessings we've seen. I mean, to see as many times that the baptismal waters have been stirred, as many times that people have come forward being saved, as many times as we've, we've gone on mission trips ourselves, but had so many missionaries called out of our church, over 20 serving on fields right now for the glory of God. Some would be happy just to have one. Be thrilled. And we've been honored. And I find this out, though, that, you know, the more some churches get blessed the more they think little of it. I remember when we went to Highland Park Baptist Church back in the 1970s, I was going to Bible college. They had people saved every service, and after every service, Dr. Robertson would baptize. Now, I'd say it's a pretty powerful thing to see people baptized every service. And yet there were some people, the thing is, when he baptized, he, he would do one of two things. He would either, maybe if the message and everything went extra long, he would say, uh, now you can leave, but, but when the lights go down, everyone is to be seated or be still because we'll be baptized. And boy, some would make the run for the door. They didn't want to have to wait to see people get baptized. And then sometimes he would just go up there and baptize. He might baptize 15, 20 folks. And you can see people, man, when's he going to let us out? When's he going to let us out? And thinking, you sorry folks, you ought to be thrilled to death at what you're able to have a part of. Good night. God blesses in an invitation. And some people, when is this going to get over so we can get out and beat the Methodists to the restaurant? Yeah. Got to get to that salad bar. Do you understand if you go a little bit later that it'll be fresh for you? <laughs> See, there's a different way to think of this thing. But we have been blessed. And I'm not talking. I mean, we've got a nice building. Thank the Lord for the building. But I'm going to tell you why. I said this when we got into this building. I'd rather have the old building and the cramped space and super hot during the summertime on Sunday nights with the power of God and the Spirit of God and the Spirit of service that we saw than to be in a nice building with carpeted floors and padded pews with even a lumbar section so you can sit in more comfort. And a nice central heating and air conditioning and commodes. Those of you who were in that other building, there weren't many. And the hallway was only that wide. 
I'm talking about the hallway just to get into the bathrooms. I would rather have that and the spirit of service and the spirit of sacrifice and the volunteerism that we have than have all this and miss it. I'd rather have that where a person couldn't get past the foyer without having their hand shaken several times than for a person to be able to walk into this building and sit down in the service and nobody come by them to shake their hands. Man, we ought to be looking for folks when we walk in this building who we can greet, who we can make welcome, who we can tell, man, we're glad you're here. Some people get so comfortable, they just got to make sure that... Brother Fiscus doesn't sit in their seat. They don't want to have to sit in the next pew. Hey, that's what they're most concerned about. And they're afraid that they'll move. Man, if if, if I go shake somebody's hand, somebody will get my chair. When we ought to be more concerned about whether or not we have represented Christ properly to those who visit us. With the friendliness that we ought to have toward one another. You see, I'm not talking about a nice building. I I look at the thousands of souls that have been saved, not only here, but in other lands as well, from the missionaries that are sent out. Over 20 families have gone out. Now, Brother Vince, do you know how many pastors we have out there? We've got several that are out there now to Madison Baptist Church, pastoring in different places. Did you ever get a count? About 17. Plus, we've got evangelists out there. I mean... Good night, all that's out of this place. Think what if all those people were here? You'd have to get here five for a seat. But the blessing of having them out, winning the loss to Jesus Christ. What an outreach. We have truly been blessed. We have more in resources than we've ever had. And over the years, we've had a great spirit. But let me share with you some implications that ought to concern us just from this passage alone. Because what he says to this church, it's all good. It's wonderful. And he brings them to reality. He says, "I behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. It is too easy for us to sit and simply look at what God has done in this place and somehow think we've done enough when the truth is we haven't hardly done anything he's done it all and the truth is to whom much is given much shall be required we are responsible more today to do things for God than what we were when we were running 120 we're more responsible today now is not the time to take our ease And to eat, drink, and be merry, and rest on past accomplishments. Now is our time to be faithful to God. Let me give you a couple things we learned from this passage. Number one, it's possible to lose that which we have. Yes, it's possible to lose that of spiritual possession and power and worth. I mean, after all, all over America today, there are church buildings where at one time an excited, soul-winning, missions-giving, mission-sending church sat And today, they're cold and empty and lifeless and nothing is going on. I don't know about you, I don't want that. I do not want that. What a horrible thought that would be. You see, one of the things we learn about losing that which we have is this can happen on any level of spiritual attainment. I mean, you look at some of the comrades of the Apostle Paul. For instance, he had Demas with him. He's mentioned three times in the Scripture. The first two times he is mentioned very positively. In Philemon 24, he is called a fellow laborer. But you get to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, and he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. A man who knew what it was to sacrifice. A man who knew what it was to do without. A man who knew what it was to minister to others. And now he's just out there in the world accomplishing nothing. man who even the Holy Ghost of God gave a spiritual pat on the back with when he described him the first two times. See, he's connected with Paul and Luke, the writers of over 150 of the 260 chapters in our New Testament. He would have really been one of the big guys of the church. He's one of those that when Paul came on the scene, you'd be shocked if Demas hadn't been with him. But now here he is on the sidelines. 
You look at Uzziah back in the Old Testament, King Uzziah, 52 years, he was a king that did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. 52 years. That's a long time to serve God. That's not just a long time to be saved, man. That's a long time to serve God. And he did. He was conscious about doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But at 52 years of serving God, he thought he had reached some kind of level where he could do his own thing. And he decided to go into the temple and offer a sacrifice. Kings weren't allowed there. Only the priest was allowed there. And when the priest came and rebuked him, Uzziah, the good king, was struck with leprosy and he died in shame. He lost that which he had. He had honor from God and he lost that honor from God because of what he did. So this can happen on any level of spiritual attainment. And if you ever think you get to the place that you've done enough, that you've done so much that now you can sit back and criticize what others are doing while you do nothing... You're going to find yourself losing that which you had. Amen. Hold fast that which you have. It can happen to the best of people. You know, you think about people like Judas Iscariot. Here he'd been in the midst of the group with the Messiah. Three and a half years he'd walked with Jesus. It's always funny to me when you hear somebody that run down a pastor, and they run down a pastor by mentioning some people he's had in his congregation. Think they do that to Jesus? I mean, Jesus taught for three and a half years. According to them, he was a, an abysmal failure because all of them just fainted away from him and one of them betrayed him and another one even denied him. After three and a half years of walking with Jesus, he must have been a failure. No, he wasn't a failure. The Son of God, the perfect sinless Son of God. But you know, he wouldn't even save Judas Iscariot against his will. Truth is, you can be an NBC World Mission missionary. I mean among great missionaries. You can be an NBC deacon among some, some of the greatest deacons. You could be among one of the greatest speakers at conferences. And uh, <laughs> you say, man, I, and by the way, I'm for being around the right kind of people. But they are not going to be the ones to see to it that you walk continually with the Lord. You've got to make some decisions. I know you said, man, but preacher, I get tired. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. All right, you get tired. I understand, man. We've been busy. We've had a lot going on. It's one thing to be tired. It's another thing to just wear out and sit back. Our time now is for service. Not only that, this type of thing, you can lose what you have in any kind of place. I mean, after all, in this particular case, he's writing to a church. This is at a church. He said, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. That's a pretty good environment. Hey, I'd say the Garden of Eden was a pretty good environment. They didn't have to walk out their, their hut door and take a look at some beer joint or strip joint. They never had to worry about getting on the internet and seeing a bunch of filth. They never had to worry about any type of uh, uh, beer commercials or any drug dealers down the street. There wasn't anything like that going on. They were in the absolute perfect environment. But they disobeyed God. And look at the mess that it created. I've, I've been to some good Bible colleges. I'm talking about, I've preached in some good Bible colleges. But everybody, I don't care what Bible college you go to, you name, name the name of any good fundamental Bible-believing Bible college you want to name. And they've all had people that have gone there on fire for God and never make it to get the degree, but dropped out and end up just sitting on a pew criticizing what's going on in some church out there. And yet they were in a good, listen, because they had dropouts doesn't mean it was a bad Bible college. And it doesn't mean they weren't on fire when they went there. But they got careless. Something happened. Who said, well, somebody probably did them wrong. I got news for you. You just stay alive. Someone will do you wrong. Amen. We need to raise up some people to grow up. Amen. Realize this isn't a kiddie thing where how much fun did you have today? This is life and our life is about serving God and you serve God and people are going to do you wrong. 
Jesus said it's impossible, but what offenses will come, you can count on it. You can go to the best of churches, go to the finest place. I mean, you've never seen a place like that place, anywhere near that place. And if you're there long enough, someone's going to hurt your feelings. So you buck it up. I tell our Bible college students all the time. So, man, Bible college is for two reasons. One's to train you for the ministry. The other's to weed out those who ought never get in it. And if you're going to get your feelings hurt and quit, don't even get in it because they'll be hit, they'll be hurt the first Sunday. People will misunderstand the decision. You you can make decisions. I had a preacher call me one time. I said, preacher, brother Mike, he said, I'm so concerned. I'm afraid I'm going to lose my ministry over this thing. He talked about something that had taken place and a decision he had to make. And I said, preacher, I learned this a long time ago. I don't care what decision you make. I don't care how sincere and honest your desires are. There's going to be people out there that are going to think you're just a sorry rascal. And that's the reason you made the decision you made. Because they know they would have made a different decision. I had a preacher call me one time. He'd been counseling one of our members. I, I guess, I, I don't know if he knew this gal from the neighborhood or whatever. And he called me up to rebuke me. And I said, now that's very interesting. I said, now, tell me what was said to you. I said, all right, here's the reason I gave the counsel. And I gave this counsel. And I said, what would you have told her? Oh, I'd have told her the same thing. Oh. Might have been a good idea if you to check before you just went along with everything that came out of her mouth. It's absolutely amazing to me because somebody says this guy gave some bad advice or he had a bad motive or he treated me wrong. We just automatically accept it must be the truth because we all know that preachers are just mean. We just rejoice in running people off. Now, you know, missionaries can do that and still get paid. <laughs> Pastors can't. A lot of people never thought of that one. So I'm surrendered to the mission field. And, no, I'm sorry. The truth is, every pulpit has a potential demus in it. Every deacon board has a potential demus on it. Every Sunday school teacher is a potential demus. Every pew is full of potential demises. Every one of us have that potential. And if you think, preacher, not me, then you are a prime candidate. Because you're not watching for it. We need to understand we, need to understand we have some weaknesses. Remember I preached a message a few years ago, I don't trust you. And the second point of the message was most of all, though, I don't trust myself. And that's funny. That night I said, you know, I, you can count on it. Somebody comes to me and says, preacher, we're 110 percent behind you. I know they're gone within the next six weeks. You can count on it. I hate to hear that. So after I preached that, one of our men went out and shook my hand at the door and said, preacher, I'm 84 percent behind you. They lasted 12 weeks. All right. <laughs> Just kidding about that. <laughs> Not only can it happen in any kind of place, but it can happen to any kind of church. You know, the truth is complacency is often born of prosperity. It's interesting, even in our particular movement, the number of churches that started in storefronts or very, very small buildings. And boy, people were willing to sacrifice anything to see it grow. They're willing to go out extra on visitation. They're willing to come in and set up chairs every Sunday. They're willing to do just stay as late as they needed to stay, come as early as they needed to come, do whatever they needed to do. And then the thing grows and it becomes big and they become complacent. And suddenly it's not important anymore. Truth is, when you start thinking, I've done enough, it's time for others to do it, then you're about to lose that which you have. It's always time for us to be busy for God. Always time for us to be at our best for God. See, if not, you'll get to loving what you're busy in. 
Jesus said, man cannot serve two masters. He will hate the one, love the other, or else he will hold the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. As you know, I'm not against hobbies. But when hobby becomes your love, you're in trouble. You're going to find yourself hating the things of God. You're going to find yourself hating every call for commitment you hear from any preacher. You're going to find hating it, brother, when the things, when your house becomes your God. You're going to hate it when you hear the preacher call for, let's give more to faith promise. Or we need to give. We've got a family in need. We need to give. Our ministry. One of the strengths, I believe, of Madison Baptist Church over the years has been its giving spirit. Man, and it's been a blessing. Man, we've had some wonderful offerings given for folks to help them. And I'm not just talking about folks in need in our own church. I'm talking about missionaries. I'm talking about different works. I'm talking about when evangelists have come by. I mean, this has been a giving church that has meant a lot of needs. And only our reward will be told in heaven. Wouldn't it be a shame to find out we lost that reward? Because we quit now? Complacency is born of prosperity. I heard somebody give the saying many years ago, character brings prosperity and prosperity destroys character. It happens in families. It's funny, a mom and dad will have the character to work like everything and they'll, and they'll earn and end up having more than their parents ever had and they've got a nice house and my, that kid's got things that they would have never dreamed of having as kids themselves and then they end up with kids with no character. They get the kid a brand new $30,000 car and the kid wrecks it within the first six weeks because he has no character. Yes. Get him a cell phone. Could, you, could some of you adults ever imagine having a cell phone as a, as a teenager? Your parents had more sense than to trust you with anything like that. That's why there was no sense in even inventing them until later on. <laughs> then this generation has lost their mind. They have the cell phone. They can watch almost any TV program they want to have. They get the right cell phone. They can call people. They can text folks, set up things. And most parents don't. All they know how to do is turn things on. They don't even know how to check it. The kids know how to hide everything. They don't know how to hide anything. The parents. It's amazing what kids get away with. And what's happened? They end up having no godly character. Born by our prosperity. Not only that, through discouragement, growing out of adversity, struggle, and exhaustion, it can happen. Are you serving God? Well, if you're serving God, there's going to be adversity. There's going to be adversity from without. There's going to be, an, uh, there's going to be adversity from within. There's going to be adversity from the very people that you're knocking yourself out to reach. I remember hearing Dr. Robertson say many years ago, he said, you know, the people that seem to hate us the most are the people that we've done the most for. There have been times I've almost hated writing out a check to help somebody because you almost know what's coming. I'm thinking, no, I don't want to write it out because you'll hate me if I do. What do you mean, preacher? I'm needing this right now. No, you'll hate me. I know you will. Everybody hates me. The truth is, you serve God. This is not to feel sorry for anybody. This is the way it is with everybody in ministry. I don't care who it is. You serve God, you're going to be whopped, buddy, from behind by the very people you're trying to help grow. You're right. Amen. I think we can amen Brother Wagner right there, can't we? You've seen that happen, haven't you? But that's reality. That doesn't mean, well, I'm just going to stop. This isn't fair. Fair? Fair? When has the world ever been fair? By the way, is that word even found in our Bible? Fair? Right is found in our Bible. Just is found in our Bible. Good is found in our Bible. God doesn't say, be fair unto others as you would have them be fair unto you. This fact of losing what you have also comes from living too much in the past. It's interesting. Churches with noble past seem to be subject to this the most. 
Philippians chapter 3, Paul gives us some wise words. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, forgetting the things which are behind. You know, we've seen God do a lot of great things, but that's the whole point. God's done it. We've had the privilege of going along for the ride. We've had the privilege of serving Him, the Almighty, the All-Powerful One. And for some reason, He has chose to do some great things here. Worst thing can happen to us, get hung up on what we used to do. We need to be dealing with what we've got to do. I mean what's before us to do. What's ahead of us to do. We still got a whole county that needs to be reached for God with all the churches we've got here. That I'll guarantee you that two-thirds of the people in Madison County didn't even go to church today. Any kind of church today. Some because they didn't leave their barn until two or three o'clock in the morning. And he says, awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. The truth is, I don't go back over the numbers for every anniversary that we've had. I don't, I don't give you that stuff. Matter of fact, I don't even add up the number of souls we see say, I just know it's a bunch every year. Because I don't want you to get hung up on that. I got news for you. A lot more souls need to be saved this year. A lot more families need to be reached this year. All right, we've sent out over 20 missionaries. How about sending out over 20 more? That'd be pretty powerful. Like to see it. Let's see God continue to do some great things. He says, hold fast that which you have. Let no man take thy crown. So, number one, it's possible to lose that which you have. Number two, it's possible to hold that which you have too. After all, he wouldn't command you to hold it if you couldn't hold it. I mean, we have the same spiritual resources and defenses that made the church in ancient Philadelphia invincible. I mean, we have the same gospel. And yeah, Paul could write, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. See, we don't need the emerging church. Man, we've got the powerful gospel. We've got the gospel to bring salvation to all who believe. Man, that's awesome. I get to preach the same gospel that's been preached for centuries. I get to preach the same gospel that I got saved by. That all the saints of the past have gotten saved by. The same gospel. I've got the same body of truth. I've got the word of God right here. And the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Listen to me, Christian. I don't care if you're a shy Christian, an outspoken Christian. The power is not in your personality. The power is in the word of God. Share it. Wield it. We've got the same gospel. We've got the same body of truth. We've got the same Savior. We've got the same God they had in Philadelphia. Amen. We've got the same promises. We've got the same great commission. None of that has changed. Hallelujah. Not only that, we have the confirmation of nearly 2,000 years of Christian history to validate our faith, to undergird our labors. You know, the people of the book of Hebrews were going through persecution and they were getting discouraged. A bunch of those folks were thinking about going back into Judaism. And he reminds them through the book, man, you have something better than the angels. You have something better than Moses. You have something better than the prophets. And he goes through, you got something better than the Aaronic priesthood. He's going through how they have it so much better. And he says near the end, you've not yet resisted on the blood. Oh, I know we've been facing some really bad newscasts, haven't we? Really concerns us what's going on. Read a headline the other day that some of our American military in Afghanistan had their Bibles burned. And not by the Afghanistanis. Our government forced it. Can you imagine that? That doesn't surprise us, but it does shock us that somebody be so bold and so brazen as to even think about doing that. What kind of nonsense is this? It's politically correct nonsense. And it's in control. We said, man, are we concerned? What on earth is going? You've not yet resisted unto blood. 
The Christians are having a hard times in different places. Yeah, but we've not yet resisted unto blood. And by the way, if the time comes that we do end up being persecuted, that is people losing their lives simply because they're Christians, then we'll just simply be in the line with the saints of the past. Brother, I, can we handle it like those believers? Trusting the same God, believing in the same God. You know, the truth is, and by the way, going out like a believer is not going out in a blaze of glory, shooting all the people that are coming to get us. It's going out like Paul went. It's going out like Jesus went. Going out with his example. You look at the Hall of Faith, you can serve God to the very end. I can look at some men, I think of Clinton Bryant. A lot of you don't know, didn't know Brother Bryant, but he pastored over in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. I don't think Faith Baptist Church ever got to a hundred more than a couple times the entire time he was there. I thought he was one of the best preachers I ever heard. I love Brother Bryant. Boy, there was a man that had a backbone that was made of steel. And boy, he'd preach. He'd just thunder out the Word of God. Uh, I had him here to preach a Losing Your Head revival, I think, the first or second year that I was here. And he preached on the three men in the Bible in three nights, three men who lost their head. You know, he preached on Saul, and he preached on John the Baptist, and he preached on Goliath, three men that lost their head. Powerful thing. But that man in that place where he was at just stayed faithful to God right on up to the end. Listen, wherever God puts you, I don't care if it's a Sunday school class with uh, five boys in it, just stay faithful yeah. all the way to the end. You'll say, well, I, I just don't see any sense in teaching. There's only five or there's only three. Or, and if you have that attitude, you have no business teaching a hundred. Brother, you ought to be willing to teach one if that's all you have. I don't have a lot of patience for Sunday school teachers. They only have one, so they put the child in another class while they go off to someplace else. That, that absolutely makes no sense to me. Amen. Brother Mark Moore, remember when I started the Wednesday morning service? Started the Wednesday morning service back in, I don't know, was it 90, 91, somewhere around in there, maybe 92. And we started because at that time we had six of our men that went on second shift. And after about six weeks, five of them went back to first shift. Mark Moore was left on second shift. And so he'd come every Wednesday morning and he got the whole load. <laughs> now see, what's tough about that, in this auditorium, you see, if I'm preaching something where I know I'm hitting Brother Daniels over here, I can be preaching it while I'm looking over here. But if I was hitting Brother Moore, he was the only person to look at. <laughs> so he got it all. And just faithful, just kept coming and just kept coming. He's faithful right through there. I've always felt the preacher isn't willing to preach to one. He has no business preaching to hundreds. Amen. Amen. Man, we're called to preach. Yes. Amen. says, though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And brother, whatever crowd God puts you before, that's the most important crowd to you in the world right there. Not only that, we have the same divine overseer who encouraged the faithful Philadelphian. He walked in the midst of the candlestick, and he has walked in the midst of here. That's awesome when you think about Jesus being present tonight. I wonder if we'd have looked a little better if we would have thought about Jesus being here tonight. I mean, the truth is, you know, you could think of some big celebrities. You think, wow, if they were there, I'd, I'd, I'd be looking a little different. I'd be acting different tonight. Well, hey, Jesus is here. You get to realize, I get to go to church. Jesus will be there. When you invite folks, say, hey, we got we, we have somebody. He's with us every week, so it's not like he's a guest at all, but Jesus is going to be in our services tonight. Wouldn't you like to come? Amen. And by the way, that's not crazy. It's true. Amen. He's been here. Thank God for that. Yes. We must stay close to him. You read through the book of De Deuteronomy, and it seems like that was Moses' heart's burning desire. Oh, that God's people would stay close to God. There were so many blessings that God would have for His people that they'd just simply stay on fire for Him and love Him with all their hearts. You say, but preachers, just don't understand. I've been discouraged. I understand being discouraged. Who hasn't been discouraged? 
Now, I heard a preacher a couple months ago got up and said, you know, I can honestly say in 50 years of ministry, I've never been discouraged. And I thought, wow, I can't go through a week without being discouraged. How do you do that? That's an unusual personality, Brother Boyf. And then he started telling about his first wife dying. And I thought, well, wait, just never discouraged. <laughs> Some of you are getting that. The rest of you need to get it soon because I need to move on. You know, Jesus gave us a comforter that can take us through the discouragements. We shouldn't have to be run to the doctor for a pill to try to get us encouraged. He is our strength. He is our fortress. He is our shield. There have been a number of mornings when I've walked through this auditorium praying, discouraged, and I've opened up my Bible. I've got some particular psalms that I turn to, and I'll just walk around, and I'll just read them out loud about God being my fortress, my strength, my deliverer, my rock, my salvation. I'm going to tell you what, you start reading that out loud and you start thanking God for each one of Yes, God, you are my rock. Yes, God, you are my fortress. Yes, God, you are my strong tower. Man, eventually you've got to walk out of there encouraged. He is enough to see us through any battle. He's enough to see us through anything. Peter got out of the boat. And I applaud Peter for getting out of the boat. I applaud Peter for walking on the water. I'd have been like the other disciples. I stayed there and said, that Peter. Yes. <laughs> Who's he think he is? Big show off. And the truth is, when he started going, glub, glub, I said, ha ha, Peter. <laughs> but you got to know when Jesus sat Peter down in that boat, those other disciples were sitting there thinking, I wonder if I could have done that. But they'll never know. They never got out of the boat. Instead of being discouraged, Peter, you can be encouraged by that. At least you had something to get out of the boat. Is it sin? Maybe that sets you back? The Bible does say, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12. Boy, sin will rob you. You start getting into the wrong things on the internet. You start getting into the wrong things on the TV. You start listening to the wrong music. And even as much as you may have loved Jesus last year, you'll find that'll wane. You'll find that'll go by the board. And it won't be long that fulfilling your desires become more important than doing the will of God in your life. Because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. That iniquity, though, doesn't have to be pornography on the Internet. It doesn't have to be rock music. That iniquity might be a critical spirit. That iniquity might be gossip. That iniquity might be unforgiven sin where somebody wronged you and you just won't put it aside. Buddy, it'll rob your joy. It'll rob you of your love for Him. Is it self that does it? For some people, it's worry of the future. And yet God has a great insurance plan, or should I say, a great assurance plan for us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. What are we going to do if Y2K really knocks out all those computers? What are we going to do? Matthew 6.33, I'll see you through it. Well, what are we going to do if all this stimulus money that's got to bring on inflation, if it doesn't bring on inflation, it'll be the first time in the history of mankind. It's got to, man, we've got four times the largest debt this year that this country has ever had in any year. It's got to bring that on and high unemployment too. How are we going to make it? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. What? Food and clothes. He tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, in having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Amen. God says, man, I know you're there. I'll take care of you. Amen. But maybe it's not worry about the future. Maybe it's worry about the present. Like I read the story to you today that Brother David sent to me about over in South Korea right now, that North Korea has sent some of their warships into South Korean fishing waters. And they're looking imminently at possible attack at some of their boats that are there. North Korea is bragging about the fact they can drop 500 rounds of, of mortars and rockets an hour on the city of Seoul. 
Surely they wouldn't do that. It only takes the first guy to fire someplace to get it started. And it won't just affect Seoul. You think, well, I thank God we're a long way from Seoul. Do you think that's where it would end? What are we going to do? Well, how about if we set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth? For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And Christ who is our life. Man, he'll take care of us. We can trust God. He's got the man. I'll tell you, he is the one. Who looks out for you all the time. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. So instead of worrying about the present, worrying about the future, how about if we just decide, man, we're going to serve God. We're going to stay faithful to God. We're going to build upon that which God has allowed us to see and expect His continued blessings. We're not going to sit back. We're not going to back off. But we want to see God do even more than ever before. Judges chapter 5 and verse 2. Because I believe there's something even more sinister where we lose our love that drove us in the past. In Judges 5, 2, he says, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. Now, that's in what took place in the story of Deborah and Barak in the book of Judges. And after they got that great victory over Sisera and that crowd... God says, when the people willingly offered themselves, that's when he avenged. That's when he intervened. So how about if we put God to the test? You know, I had that interesting thought. I don't know if it was last Wednesday night or last Sunday night. Maybe we ought to just have an offering. Let's see if we could outgive God. Let's have an outgive God Sunday. Truth is, you can't do that. You can't outgive God. It's not possible to outgive God. It'd be kind of fun to try it, though, wouldn't it? To sit, that kind of scares us. And some of you, you just get this frightful look on your face when I even say this. But the whole point is this, folks. And I, and we're, I don't have one plan, by the way. We can trust Him. Amen. You trusted Him with your soul, the most precious possession that you have. Surely you can trust Him with everything else. You can trust him. Amen. Nehemiah 11, 2, it says, And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. So God says to this church, Hold fast that which you have. Hold fast that which you have, that no man take that crown. But then that's up to us, isn't it? People walk in those doors. There will be a flock of people. Greeting them. It'll be like a gauntlet having to go through with people shaking their hands. I mean, knocking ourselves out to reach more. Having the best VBS we've ever had coming up in July. Having the best... Listen, just doing whatever... And we better do it while it's day. Because the night is coming when no man can work. Hold fast which thou hast. Madison Baptist Church. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God, deal with our hearts tonight. If there's one here without Christ, I pray they'd come to Jesus who would save them. He loved them so much. He died on the cross to pay for their sins, was buried and rose three days later from the dead. I pray they'd come to Jesus tonight. I pray, Heavenly Father, for our people tonight. Lord, please, may we get it. May we hold fast that which we have. Let no man take our crown. God, some need to re-enlist. Some need to get stirred up and on fire again. Some need to get the servant's heart back. Oh, God, make us the people you'd have us to be. And we'll praise you and thank you for every bit of it in Jesus' name.